encourage you to open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're going uh, into, we're really finishing up a section uh, that is dealing with, really, life in the, uh, in the Christian home, at least in the whole section is around uh, and focused on the Christian home. And so, uh, if you, I mean, the chapter itself obviously introduces itself with that glorious question that we're familiar with, at least now. I hope we're familiar with it. If then you've been raised with Christ, and that is meant to cause that resignation in your heart, not the re- resigning, but actually a, more of a, a, something that resounds in your heart, maybe that's the right word, sorry, that you, you're, you're looking at this, this truth that you have been raised with Christ. So if you've been raised with Christ, and Paul is saying in such a way to say, and I believe that's true, so if you've been raised with Christ and that's true of you, then we're to live a different life, a new life. We've got new life in Christ. Uh, you could call it a raised life. Resurrection has effect. That which was dead has come to life. So you were spiritually dead. You've been raised. That's why that term is used. You've been raised to newness of life. And that new life is going to change everything. And so Paul is just dealing with the nature of new life in Christ. And that, we, 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 that it has changed our, our interaction in every way. It's changed us. Fundamentally, we become new creations, God would say. Uh, so as new creations, we live our lives a different way. So it just shapes us, it shapes all about us, it shapes our very approach. In fact, the Colossians 3.21, where we ended a couple weeks ago, is really it does affect, it changes even in the parenting relationship. And so this is not our primary text, but I just wanted to touch on it because it's, 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 it just connects because this is dealing with uh, the Christian household. So it shapes our very approach. And so it says, fathers, do not provoke. And I just give you some other, I mean, that term provoke is the idea of embitter, exasperate, make resentful. Uh, so don't cause your children that kind of response uh, lest they become discouraged. So in our parenting, uh, we've been entrusted with really God's children. They're his, and they've been entrusted to us, and we have to raise them. And as we raise them, we face the difficult reality of the effect of sin both on them and you. Okay, because they're little sinners, they're going to sin. That means they're going to at times disobey you, they're not going to listen. In fact, sometimes they'll just flat out disrespect you. And all of that will be true because they were born sinners. And then that then becomes the part that the response of you to their sin is what's going to either lead to their being taught or they're exasperated. So as a sinner disciplining another sinner, it is a very big challenge. And Paul is facing that to us. And he is he's really giving us this issue as parents. In parenting, we are teaching our children to love and obey the Lord ultimately As they defy your authority, how do you respond to it? And you need to respond to it in such a way that your life really does model what God's doing with you. You've got to remember, when you discipline your children, you're God's child. When your child has exasperated you, remember you've done that to the Lord. So in each way, when at times you feel like, I couldn't extend, I'm, I'm being a little too gracious, maybe a little too patient, you really need to stop and say, are you? Because has God been that patient with you? Has he been that long suffering with you? Well, absolutely he has. And so you can continue to be long-suffering with your children and continue to teach. It's not that you let them get away with sin. God doesn't let you get away with sin either. Okay, so God is going to work through that sin to bring you forward into the peaceful fruits of righteousness. God's going to do that. You are then called on as a parent who knows the Lord to model that reality, to model it in your children's life, that they see in your life that you're one that is pursuing righteousness. You're one who actually is learning to grow in your own hatred from sin, that you are digging into the Word, that you're being taught, you're growing in wisdom. How are they going to learn any of that? They think you, if you, you give your, your children the idea you've got your act all together, you give them a bad idea about what spiritual growth looks like. Sometimes I think we, we bought into and we did this kind of educationally. It's like uh, we give you a certificate, you know, we give you diplomas. Well, the diploma is a termination point, right? So it's like we give kindergartners a kindergarten diploma, and then in first grade they act like they learned everything they needed to know, all right? Then we do it again, maybe in junior high. Some people do it there. Then you do it at high school. And each way along the way, it's like, you know you haven't finished learning yet, right? Uh, sometimes I, I, I get to teach our school. I remind our students that this is just the beginning of learning, and they look at me like, no. I mean, lifelong learners is what we've actually been called to be. One of the places that's supposed to be modeled is in parenting of children. That you are actually to model to your children that you're a student of the Word. That there's an authority greater than yours. And that you're under that authority. How do they learn to live under authority? They learn from you. And this is important because it does tie into the very section that we're going into. Uh, so 
we are to, to model, practice both patience and encouragement before our children, just as the Lord has done that with us. This section is, is really framed in, this whole section that we're dealing with is framed kind of front and end uh, with this admonition, whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is before we get to, to wives and husbands and children, that section begins with whatever you do. So as you live out your relationship as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a parent, you're to do it in such a way that it actually magnifies the worth of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to do in the name of. It is due in reflection that you belong to Christ and how you conduct yourself in that role that God has given you is to be reflective of you being under his authority. So you live it out in the name of Jesus Christ. And so in Colossians 3.23, uh, which is in the middle of the, or at the end of the section dealing with bond servants, it says, whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord. So whatever you do, so in all of these relationships, we're doing it to the Lord. We're to do it in such a way reflects that we belong to the Lord. So this morning we're going to focus our attention really specifically on this section on 22 uh, down to chapter 4 and verse 1 uh, is where we will settle our attention. So I, I'm going to read it again and then we're going to begin making some com- we'll, we'll comments here. But bondservants obey in all things. Your master is according, uh, according to the flesh and that idea of according to the flesh just means human, okay? So you have a master you're going to see in chapter 4, verse 1. We all have master, the one in heaven. Genuine, real master, real Lord. Or tying back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So there's really one true master over all. So we're writing to a believing community. That's important to keep in context. This is a believing community. They're all together in church. All the members of the household are there. So that means wives are there, husbands are there, children are there, bond servants are there, masters are there. They're all together hearing the word of God taught as brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, that's important to remember. And so the masters obey according to the flesh. Those are your human masters. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just fair, knowing you also have a master in heaven. And so as we jump into this section, one of the things that we need to remember is that uh, obviously this is is dealing with uh, a local church and a local assembly. And it is a sensitive issue because if you just, again, contextually, it's important for us to tie this a little bit back in historic context, all right? So I'm going to try and do that and help us think through this. Uh, Onesimus is actually one sent with this very letter. Onesimus is a runaway bond servant or slave. You can see it used in Philemon. So he is from Colossae. He has left Colossae. He ran away. He has joined Paul. He has now gotten saved. And now he's being sent back to Colossae with the letter. So he and Tychius, or uh, depending on how, if you, Tychius way, I'd say it English, but it really would be Tychios in more of a Greek pronunciation. But those two men are sent back from Paul with the letter to Colossians, to the Colossian believers. So here you can imagine the scene. So you have a runaway slave who's sent back to his hometown, to the church, where Onesimus, I mean, where Philemon is a member as well. And now he's coming back with a letter from Paul. This is a sensitive issue. And so there he's coming back and he's presenting the letter. And Paul refers to Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother at the end of, cha- of Colossians chapter 4. Uh, to Philemon, which was the letter also sent back. He came back with that letter with him to Philemon, a member of the church at Colossae. And it says, For perhaps he, speaking of Onesimus, departed for a while for this purpose, that you may receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but now how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so Paul has given instruction to Philemon, and he's telling Philemon of Onesimus' conversion and how Onesimus has served Paul. And he's encouraging Philemon to receive him as a brother. And so one of the things to point out is the term translated in Philemon, slave, is the same term in Colossians that is translated as bond servant. Okay, So where we have, I'll go back here for a second, the term bond servant. It's one in the same term, okay? So it is, it is a term uh, in the Greek language uh, that is 
doulos, all right? I had a shirt. I taught Greek. I've taught Greek before here. Taught it uh, a couple different times. So uh, some of the young men that I taught Greek to got me a shirt. It said doulos de he Christu, so slave of Christ. So I liked that shirt. I still have it. Uh, but doulos means slave, servant is the way we often translate it. Now, this is where we get kind of a sense of issue. When you bring this up, there's always already, a, already in one sense, kind of a, a wince. We don't talk about slavery. It's a bad topic. Uh, fact is, the, the fact of the matter is, in most of our translations, everywhere doulos shows up, it gets translated as bondservant or servant, which is actually a bad translation. It just is. It's not what the term means, uh, but it is the way we translate it, and there's a reason behind it, and it is a historic reason. And part of the historic reason is because of the negative backdrop of the slave trade business that was a part of British history and American history. They were a part. So that negative backdrop is one of the reasons in English translations, we've kind of moved away from the uh, translating doulos as slave to a bondservant. It also fit in with English culture uh, in terms of they understood a bondservant was one and the same thing. We don't think that way. Once you put the word servant there, we think volunteerism. Uh, we tend to take this text, and I've heard a lot of messages preach, uh, in the employee-employer relationship. And while I, there's certainly application to that, it is application, this is a text that is within the family that existed in its historic context in that culture. Up to one-third of all Romans were, were slaves. Okay? Slave was not a skin tone issue in the Roman Empire. Okay? It wasn't. It was a conquered issue. So Rome conquered many nations, many lands. They conquered, and they enslaved the people. They conquered. They went to work. They, be, they really were, in many ways, an employee. But they, their complete subsistence, their, their existence, was dependent on the master. The master provided for them, provided protection, provided uh, all of that for them. So that's the culture in which we're writing to. There was slavery as a part of that culture. And those slaves were, what we should note, in a Christian culture, what immediately changed is the slaves are at church together with masters as brothers and sisters. That's an immediate change of culture. It's a radical shifting. The recognition of at, at really equal footing in the body of Christ was a radical shift of that day. So they are now there together, brothers and sisters, under the Word of God, and they're going to be taught the Word of God together. Uh, one of the things, and I uh, just did a lot of reading this week, uh, just one of in. in uh, Carl Truman, who's a scholar and, and a historian, has written some that just kind of helpful tracing some of where we've gotten in American culture historically and then some of the devaluing of historic realities. Um, and it, I, I don't have time to get to all of it, but I can just kind of say, tell you, would like to say a lot more than I probably should this morning on all that, but uh, you're just getting to where we live in a day where we don't, we either rewrite history to fit a narrative that we want in the present, or we ignore history. One of the two. You have both going on. We tend to ignore history out of this issue of technology and science. I mean, have any of you getting tired of just trust the science? Trust the science. The ideology behind that is science will discover a new way, so we'll have something better in the future, so we'll wait and we'll bank all of our future on science making a new scientific discovery. Now, we're all thankful of scientific discovery and advancement. That kind of goes with technology which is the other feed of why we don't value history. If you go back a few, just a few generations, you had younger people coming to older people to learn how to use technology because they were the ones who created it, used it. Younger went to the, to, to the older to learn how to use the equipment. You got trained, you apprenticed under, you learned from them. We live in a day today where technology is coming out so fast that now the younger generation has usually quicker to obtain to this technology than they begin to think the older generation has nothing to teach them, which is why they are so unintelligent. Because if you devalue history, you're destined to destroy yourself. Because the lessons of history are to be taught and they are to be really brought forward from the older teaching the younger. Read your Bible. The older teach the younger. They teach wisdom and they actually teach you how to use technology and how to understand history correctly. You got a third stream that affects all of this which gets into the whole deconstructionism. So you get into all that basically let's recast history as basically a history is a retelling of how the powerful have abused the marginalized. 
So we have to take, the history is just told by the powerful, and it really is not accurate. It is, and so they want to recast history in another language, really differently than it actually happened. So we don't learn lessons from history. We actually diminish history, and then we're left in the quandary of we just do what we think is right, what we feel is right. And thus you have American culture, deeply confused doesn't understand its own history. You have those who've lived the history they are wondering why you have a generation of younger people that have, have, that have no understanding of what the kind of decisions they're making and the results are going to come. And you can stand here and say, yeah, if you understood history, you'd know. But they've been taught to devalue history. History to them is what's happening now and the future holds the answers. Can I just tell you that this holds the answers? And this demands we know our history as well as our future. And that we don't put our faith in science or technology because they're not going to deliver you. Science didn't die for you. Technology cannot redeem you. Cannot create utopia, will not create heaven on earth. It's not going to do it. So we have so many false messiahs that have worked in to the culture that has created some of our whole, even all the critical race theory, this idea we recast history, and all of these issues come flooding in so that when we begin talking about an issue uh, like slavery, we all kind of wince and say, well, we, we shouldn't talk about that in the church. One question you have to ask is in the New Testament, why didn't the New Testament command slave owners to set their slaves free? And I think that's a good question. I think the answer really forms around this. The early church was not really in a position to tell culture what to do, nor did it see it as its job. The church actually hasn't been fundamentally called to social justice. I know that's popular today. I know there's lots of churches that have their social justice flags out, and they're going to march to the tune of we need to rewrite all the social injustices of history. But actually, the church's mission is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ brings reconciliation of lost souls back to Jesus Christ. And you know, at the end of discipleship, the evils that we know of that took place in the context of slavery would go away. They would just simply go away as disciples make other disciples because people would not treat each other outside of the gospel. And so they didn't need to address it. They addressed them within their own relationships and how to treat one another, which would actually bring an end to the horrors and the evils that took place within the slave trades. And so those things would go away. The other side is, and this is just a reality, folks, we don't use the term slavery, but you do know there are slaves in our culture right now. We call it human trafficking. And I appreciate in the last administration how many young girls got set free from the sex trade, the human trafficking that has taken place all over the world at a, at a pace that is kept, it's kind of like, if you will, it's a little bit like um, in the, uh, oh, so all the children that get taken up by DSS. So we all have all the children that get taken away from their homes, uh, taken away out of abusive situations or drug addictions, and they get placed into foster care and foster system, and, and we really have kind of uh, not done a good job as a culture even talking about it. It's kind of your dirty laundry. You don't want to talk about it. But the, the, the train wreck that has happened because of our lack of history and understanding, the train wreck that's happened in American culture because we've dismissed God, has affected the family at such a level there's astronomical numbers of children that get left into uh, situations where they have no parents and they're just being taken care of, quote unquote, by the state. It is where we have orphans in our culture because the orphans that are unborn, we kill in our culture. And so that's, that, that's kind of like your dirty laundry. Well, the other side of the dirty laundry is the magnitude of sex trafficking that goes on in our nation. And, and I became aware of that when we were in Florida and a young lady that had been a part of our, grew up in our teen group, actually went on to work for a ministry that was helping young girls as they were rescued out of that. And she began to share with me what the capitals of the sex trafficking industry was and how bad it is and how many girls are in uh, that all over the United States. And the fact of the matter is we know this. In fact, we know the locations of almost all of the locations where they're being trafficked in, and we don't shut them down because of the powerful people who actually partake. Those are realities. That's the underbelly of your culture. We have slavery in our culture. We have it in many ways. When I was in Florida, we had Scientology down there, which is a religion, at least recognized as one. They go all over the world, recruit people in. They sign them up on religious visas. They bring them into downtown Clearwater. They work as slaves for that organization. I helped rescue two men, young men from that organization. 
and then worked with uh, ICE and other organizations to try and get them under protection as those were human trafficked, and they don't want to touch that issue. It's just a dirty underbelly of society. We have slavery, and you have slavery in every culture. There's slavery. You know why you have it? Because it's the nature of human depravity. The nature of human depravity is, is I don't value someone more than myself. I will abuse or use someone else for my own benefit, and I will do it without, with malice and with cause to get what I want, and that's the nature of human history. We've been doing this throughout our history. To act like slavery ended after, the, uh, after we had a civil war in our nation is a folly and a folly of a historic accuracy. It is not true. Humanity will enslave other humanity all the way until Jesus comes. You will always have slaves. And so the Bible doesn't end slavery because human depravity is not transformed by the fact the gospel has come. The gospel changes individual lives, and in that context, individual lives will be changed. And slavery, as we know the evils of it, would be fundamentally done away with. And that's how the Bible really addresses it and how the Bible addresses these issues, these social issues. Um, so you can see that slavery actually is not ended, and it is not even ended for us. Actually, we have a whole different issue, and I'll come here. Colossians says, I mean, Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, you were called while slave, don't be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he is called while free is Christ's slave. You are bought with a price. Do not become the slaves of men. And so Paul is simply saying, hey, if you were born, if you were in slavery and you're now part of the body of Christ, you're free in Christ. You're free from what really matters. You're free from sin. You've been set free from the guilt of sin, the penalty of sin. You're free in Christ. You may be under human authority, but you're free in Christ and at what really matters. And if you're free, just remember that. Your freedom is it look like you get to do what you want because you actually belong to Christ. You were bought with a price. You're, you're, you're never, in that sense, free. The freedom we have in Christ is a freedom from sin, not a freedom to do what we want, right? And so he, he gives some counsel here. You see it again in Romans. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. So in this room today, you've got two categories of slaves. There's some here today that are still slaves of sin. You've never been redeemed. And if you've never been redeemed, you're a slave. You're just a slave to the most cruel master ever. And what is that cruelty? It's sin, which always promises to deliver something that it cannot deliver, and in the end delivers only death, because that's what comes. The wages of sin is death. So the cruelty of sin is going to deliver you over to death, which isn't just going to be physical, it'll be eternal. But if you've been set free from the slavery of sin, it is not you've been set free to be you, and you be the authentic you, whatever that looks like. And you can decide that on your own, and you can decide what is authentic for you and how you feel and what it makes you feel like. That is so pagan, but it has been so brought forward into our culture that so many Christians actually buy into that. But that's pagan thought. You've been set free from the bondage of sin. You now become a slave of God, a slave of righteousness. Your life actually is to be constrained by what is right. Amen? It is. You're supposed to be constrained. What is right, whatever pleases God, what is in line with his word and his authority, that is how my life is to look. I am a slave of righteousness or a slave of God. Romans 6.22, you've been set free from sin and become the slave of God. So we're either a slave of sin or a slave of God. Slavery is not ended. It's one of the reasons why the Bible addresses it. It addresses it as it is, as it existed, as it existed in its culture. And how does the gospel transform life for those who are now either slaves of sin or slaves of God? So I will use that title, the slave of God or slave of Christ. And so it really, community life, our life together within a household and then within a community is made different in Christ. And so we see this, this, this bondservant is called on to serve, and he serves the community because he is a part of a community. He's part of a family. family. Family is the basis of all community. 
As a family functions, so does society around it, so does the church. The church is a family, it functions as a family. So this new community of faith is to live out the reality of the gospel in all of its relationships. And so Paul addresses that, and he addresses it specifically, and he gives us really four fundamental commands to those who live under authority and live out this reality of being slaves of God, slaves of righteousness. So as a bondservant, what are you to do? Well, you're to obey. I mean, these are just gospel words, right? Remember, wives were to submit, husbands were to love, children are to obey, parents are to encourage, not provoke, lest they be discouraged, so you're supposed to encourage, you're actually supposed to do the opposite of that. These are all gospel reality words. I mean, as a child of God, you're supposed to submit to God, amen? You're supposed to love God with all your heart and thus love others more than you actually love yourself. So love is a, is a product of the gospel. Submission is a product of the gospel. You're supposed to obey Christ in all things. You know, Jesus isn't, when you get up in the morning, you don't, Jesus isn't out, he is really Lord. That's what Colossians 2, 6 said. As you receive Jesus Christ, the Lord. So walk in him means live under his authority. It means that you have marching orders every day from a Lord, which is Jesus. Amen? And he didn't ask you if you felt like it this morning. In fact, we've tended to do this in church culture. I've, I've mourned this all my preaching life. I probably will all the way till the grave. That when we talk about service opportunities in the church, and we talk about people serving in various capacity, what we tend to all believe is those are all just voluntary things that if you have an opportunity, you might serve in if it's convenient to your timetable. Can I just tell you this fundamentally wrong way to think? You're a slave of Jesus Christ. Every gift and ability he gave to you was for the good of his church. You are not actually asked to serve, you're told to serve from him who is Lord. And that looks like you figuring out what gifts and abilities God's given you that then will cause you to be a blessing to others or you're actually sinning against God. I didn't get an A1, amen. You get an O me? Get off my toe or something? I mean, I don't know. But, I mean, folks, listen, you've been gifted by God to serve God, Amen. And it's not like God's in heaven saying, oh, please, please, would you please just serve me a little bit? You know, if you just do a little bit for me, I'd be so happy. Uh, we tend to think of serving, as, as, as I'm a servant, I, I serve, and we serve out of our abundance of, we don't have an abundance of time, so we serve very minimally. And that really is a fundamental faulty way of even looking at life. We are called as bond servants to obey. Those are masters according to the flesh. And so when we bring that into the context, we can talk about work. Uh, we can talk about a lot of different things. We are all under authority. I think it would be wrong to just say, well, this would be, you know, in your relationship with your boss, do what he tells you. There is qualifications given here, right? So you are to obey in all things, but you're not to do it a certain way. You're not to do it as, a, as with eye service or men pleaser, meaning that you don't, respond to people in authority based on currying favor we had terms for that when i was in high school about the teacher's pet you know the people at work who always kind of cuddle up to a boss to try and get ahead whether they do their job or not they make friendships and they make friendships for the sake of favor they don't really necessarily work hard but they're always trying to get ahead because they're using their relationship or their their uh, their personality to try and win people over and, and that's exactly what god's saying don't be you, and it's not that you don't care what people think about you, but you don't care what people think about you. You care what God knows about you. Amen? First and fundamentally, I need to care fundamentally what God knows. And I please God regardless of what people think. I please God always first because he is really the real master, the real Lord here. And so I, I need to live under authority. And so with those masters, do you, do you obey? yeah. But, I mean, there's qualifications. It's not just to curry their favor. I'm not doing it just to try and get ahead. I'm actually doing it in sincerity of heart. Meaning I honestly place myself under their authority and I carry out their actions as far as I can, but not violating the last qualification, which is fearing God. Which means, first and foremost, my loyalty belongs to God, not that master. And so whatever level of authority I'm under, I'm going to place myself under with sincerity of heart, not currying favor. 
I'm not looking for personal advantage. I'm looking to actually carry out responsibility as one under authority. I place myself under that authority, carry out to the place that they are not asking me to sin against God. No one has a right to ask you to sin against God. That's why the qualification is there, fearing God. The first person you fear is God because God's everywhere and he knows everything. And the first person you're going to defy is God if you just obey men. Now, we're living in the midst of a confusing time, folks. We are. There's so many things bombarding us in culture and so many different. So what is our responsibility to, to authority? Well, we're under authority in all kinds of ways. In workplace, as American citizens, we're under governing authorities. Are we to obey them? Yes, in all things, yes. To the place that they're not asking me to violate God. Now, we've just come to the place where there's a whole lot of that going on now. All right, because the government begins stepping over bounds and starts going into places where you're going to have to say, no, I can't do that, because to do that would be to sin against God, doesn't mean you get to cast off everything they say. You're still under authority. It's kind of like a boss could ask you, and I had bosses ask me this when I worked for EDS. They used to have, we had special projects, and we would, and they'd come in and they'd ask, to, you know, can you stay late? Yes, I can stay late. Uh, can you come in on Sunday? And I went, no, I can't. I can't. Now, I understand there's certain jobs you're going to have to work on Sunday. I, I get it. I'm not saying to work on Sunday is inherently sinful. Now, I had a Monday to Friday job on salary. Sunday was not a part of my regular work week. Special project come up. They want you to come. And I'd simply go, no, I can't. I'll be here Saturday. I'll stay all day Saturday. I'll stay late Monday, but I'm not here on Sunday. I just said, no, that would be wrong. I'm not required to be here on Sunday. I'm not going to do it. And we get into all the different, in the confusion of this day, part of what we need to wrestle through is this, and I just say a couple of things that I think we need to think through carefully. The gospel does not need our system of government to survive. So the changing landscape of an American governance system is not your biggest problem. The governing authority over us and the style of government that we have while I pray that we would see it actually function the way it was designed, as it was designed by people who generally feared, who feared God and had a, a, a reverence for God and how a, our government was set up. But whether that survives or not is not our biggest problem. The gospel does not need the way our, gov our government to survive. The gospel does not require a friendly government to advance. It doesn't. So the difficulties of being a gospel community obeys God and speaks truth, does the horizon look like it's going to get more difficult for the people of God in the future? Well, in my narrow sight of future, yeah, it does to me. Does that mean I'm right? No, it doesn't mean I'm right. I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. And I'm not saying here to make prophecy. What I am saying is that God has called you to think scripturally first, not emotionally. And our first loyalty is to Jesus Christ and to his gospel. Our first loyalty is to recognize what our culture needs more than anything is it needs Christians that are actually lights of the gospel of Jesus Christ sharing that gospel with other people, unafraid. The culture is going to use everything in its arsenal to make you afraid. They've been pretty good at it, haven't they? They're going to keep painting fear, and they're going to keep painting fear because in the painting of fear, they're going to try and push you into the place of just, you do what we say because we're the ones that are going to protect you. Can I just say government isn't going to protect you? Your protection is in the one who is the rock, the refuge, the one who never changes, who holds everything in his hands. That's where we run for security, not to government. Amen? Because if you, you, you we, we have to be able to think biblically, and we have to be able to be careful. When you're going to say no to governing authority or any authority and say, I'm going to defy you, you better make sure you're doing it actually is directly out of biblical principle and biblical application and not out of, I don't like your rules or your law. Because you're not given that authority. We are to submit in all things unless we're being asked to sin against God. And we need to recognize that what we are being called to do is to actually advance the gospel in the middle of the darkness of a culture, and the light of the gospel will always shine bright the darker a culture gets. Amen? The gospel can't be quenched. 
The gates of hell itself cannot prevail. Satan's lies will not win. No totalitarian government or whatever it becomes, no socialist government, no communist government can crush the gospel. Every time it tries, the gospel goes forward. So while we all can wince and say there's some freedoms that we might lose and those could happen, and we, you, you don't, I, I mean, I have no idea. I'm not trying to be the purveyor of all bad news. It's not what I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be, okay, how do we, in the day we live in, take the Bible and live it? And if you're not thinking that way, then we're not thinking. If all we're thinking is that everything's going to get better tomorrow, then we're not thinking biblically. The Bible's pretty clear. Because a lot of people, a lot of, I've heard plenty of people say, we must be getting closer to the time of the end. And I'm like, you know, every day we're closer. One day closer. When's Jesus coming? I don't know. He didn't tell me. But I do know this. He's coming. Amen? And I look forward to it, and sometimes as it gets more difficult to live in the fallen world, I look forward to it all the more, and therefore I should rejoice in it getting more difficult. Because when I'm comfortable, I don't necessarily look forward to it coming. Because right now my plans are my plans, I'm busy with my plans, and i got all these things I want to do, and it's comfortable, and I'm doing all this, and so Lord, yeah, I know you're coming back, but you can wait a little while, because these things are really fun right now. All of a sudden, life gets uncomfortable, and you get sick, or you get this, and it's all difficult to live in the fallen world, and pretty soon you're like, come, Jesus. Do you know we're supposed to always be living? Come, Jesus. That today could be the day, and today I could see my Lord face to face, and I'm to live that way? And so when we get shaken in our comfort, it's okay. It's discomforting. But it also helps you to figure out how many places you've put false comforts. I mean, does Trinity Baptist Church, let's just get as far as real as I can go. I mean, if we were to be taxed out of the ability to exist and have this beautiful building and this land, does Trinity Baptist Church cease to exist? No, because Trinity Baptist Church isn't a building. It's not a place. It's a group of people called out by Jesus Christ to take the gospel to this community and the surrounding community and ultimately be part of seeing the gospel go all over the world. That's why we're here. And so the discomforting things that could happen and might happen are not things that crush the gospel. Amen? The gospel is not going to be changed. Our mission hasn't changed. Our mission, our responsibility is to live out the reality of that we are under God's authority. We serve then as his slaves to make him known. And we do this with this reality that we're laying up treasures in heaven. Aren't you glad you're at treasures in heaven? If our treasure is this building, it gets taken away, we're all discouraged and depressed and we all quit. If that's your treasure, your treasure is whatever you own and you have and you hold, and it could be burned down. I'm looking at the bonnings. Uh, when it's all we, I mean, all of it, this thing's going to happen, it all gets taken away in a moment, then all we're going to have left is, is we're going to be discouraged and despondent. Folks, we are not supposed to be discouraged or despondent, Amen. We serve the one true and living God who's working through all of these things to accomplish his good purposes and his glory. We get to be a privilege to be a part of that and be making him known. So we get to be the conveyors of hope in the middle of hopelessness. Isn't that awesome? Now, some of you got gloom and doom on your face. You're not being very good conveyors of hope, okay? You don't fall into the gloom and doom and you just don't get it down, go, go down the rabbit trails of, well, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, this is going to happen, it's all going to fall apart, everything's going to go to pot, and the world's just going to come. Well, the world is coming to an end. I promise. And it will get worse before it comes to an end. I promise. Why do I promise that? Because the Bible tells me that. The Bible tells me things will wax worse and worse. People will heap to themselves things. They're going to tell them what they want to hear. There's going to be people betraying one another. All of that's a part of life in a fallen world. So in the middle of all those difficulties, am I to lose hope, throw up my hands and say, well, I just want to crawl in a hole. No. We get to go stand out on street corners. We get to go talk. We get to go in the middle of relationships as you're going, as God's sending you, and he's putting you in all these different relationships. Remember, you're a conveyor of hope because you know Jesus Christ, so you have hope. Now speak that hope into lives, and we do that by being a people who actually serve our community. We serve as slaves of Jesus Christ in those relationships. We live under authority. If we can't teach our children to live under our authority, they're going to be really bad citizens. So slaves of Christ, we look forward to the reward. We're laying up treasures in heaven. He's, Paul really roots the, the, the admonition. So the admonition given is obey your masters, your earthly masters, your human masters in all things. So that's hard. Yeah, it is hard. I'd rather be in charge. 
I'd rather be my own master. I like creating my own schedule. I want to do it my way. I, I like that. But that's not what you've been called to do. I want to be the complainer and say, well, all these things they're doing that's this against this, it's against that. I don't like this rule. I don't like that rule. I don't like how uncomfortable it is. Okay, great. God isn't going to rule the world the way you like. He's not getting off the throne and saying, how would you do it? He's going to rule it for his glory, and he's going to accomplish his good purposes through even all of the difficulties we see. He's called us to live as those under authority and to know something. What do we know? By revelation, that from the Lord you'll receive the reward. From the Lord you're going to receive the inheritance as a reward. What is the inheritance? Well, the inheritance is used consistently through the Old Testament to Israel to speak of the promised land. They're going to receive this land. They're going to receive this land. They go into the land of promise. Now, they never got fully all the land God promised because they weren't going to get it the first time. They're actually going to get it when Jesus comes again. So all the Abrahamic covenant and all the land of promise that comes and the Davidic king and the Davidic covenant, all those promises to Israel are wrapped up. The seed that would come from Abraham's seed is Jesus Christ, the king. The Davidic king that's going to reign forever is Jesus Christ. The land promises, Israel being a kingdom of priests, those are all things coming. And so the Israelites are looking forward to being in their land, being with their Savior, and actually inheriting all that God has promised them. They will be a kingdom of priests through whom all the nations will come to worship God. That is going to happen. And so when he uses that language to the New Testament believer, and he's reminding us that we are receiving an inheritance from Christ, namely we're a part of a kingdom. Do not fear, little thought, for your Father's good pleasure to give you a kingdom. I love that verse. I love that whole section on not worrying and not having all being filled with anxiety and all the things that we tend to worry about and all the temporal part of life that all gets so big and so magnified to us and we all get wrapped up in it. And I'm not saying temporal life isn't important. I'm not saying how you work isn't important or, or there, there's not things that get shaken. Oh, that's true. We go through real loss. We go through real hurt. All of this is real. Jesus really cares. God really cares. And what he has told you in the middle of that, just don't bow to fear. Because you have something far better than anything you've ever lost here. You have a kingdom coming. And it is your Father's good pleasure. Aren't you glad God delights to be a giver? Sometimes in the middle of loss, we wonder that. Sometimes we think maybe God is just taking. Maybe God's angry at me. He took from me. God's angry at sin every day. That's true. But God loves his children every day. That's true. And God is always working for good in the lives of his children. Amen? Even in the middle of your loss, God is still working for good. Even when you're struggling to believe that, God's still working for your good. And he gives a future promise that cannot be changed to remind you of that. To say, look, you're my little children. Just remember this. No matter what difficulty you're facing and how you're tempted to be overrun with worry and fear, there's a kingdom coming for you. Matthew, do not lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust and governments destroy. Well, it doesn't say that. Where moth and rust destroy and thieves. There's where the government word comes in. <laughs> and thieves break in and steal. And lay up your treasures, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, uh, dis- nor moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Folks, how do we lay up treasure in heaven? Remember, we're slaves of Jesus Christ. And so what is a slave supposed to do? Every day, report to duty. I mean, we, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. We, even in in most minimal prayer lives, most of us will thank God for the day. Or we thank him for our food. And even in that, maybe, it, maybe at times it could be trite and maybe it needs to be much deeper, but even in the simple acknowledgement of, Lord, thank you for this food, is an acknowledgement that everything you have comes from him. It belongs to him. And so we lay up treasures in heaven just by being good servants of Jesus Christ, by being good slaves of Christ. We report to duty. And we engage in the work that he's given us to do, and part of that work we know Jesus' last words to us was not, go ye and be comfortable in the world and build houses and lands and kingdoms for yourself. He didn't say, seek first your kingdom and all of these things you're going to obtain in this earth. He didn't say that. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. 
He said, go into all the world and make disciples. We lay up treasures in heaven by actually engaging in the work God's given us to do. And the thing is, one of the beauties of heaven and one of the glories of it is going to be the reality is we get to heaven, we're going to realize how many different people who knew the Lord touched our lives and impacted us and how many different people our lives impacted. I mean, you have no idea I mean, would, I would love it if, if you, you know, sometimes we, we got, you know, if you had the gift of soul winning and you could win somebody to the Lord every day. I don't think you're going to do that. Okay? I think we sow the gospel every day in our conversations and our actions, our attitudes, and all parts of our life. And we're always looking for an opportunity to share the reason for the hope that's in us. We should be cultivating relationships with lost people and showing them the love of Christ with the, with the desire to see them saved. We should long for people's salvation. Amen? And as we sow the gospel into lives, one of the things we can trust our, our Heavenly Father with is He is in the work of saving sinners. And until He takes us home, we're all a part of that work. And one day in, at home, we're going to get to see all the people's lives who've been drawn to Christ through various interactions across all of this room. It's going to be a glorious day. I mean, there's going to be people you're going to meet in heaven that's going to say, you know what, I heard you here. I, I heard your conversation with so-and-so there. You gave me a track. You told me about Jesus. You told me what God had done in your life. You to- and you're going to hear people that you probably won't even have remembered you ever talked to. And for all of heaven, then you're going to see the people that actually shared the gospel with you. And you're going to remember them, and you're going to see them in heaven, and you're going to say, thank you for caring enough about me to share the gospel with me. And of course, we're going to be in the presence of our Savior who the one who died for us. Folks, you're never going to mourn again in heaven. Whatever the difficulties you face in this earth, just remember all these things that the world keeps offering you and saying it's what life's about. Get this, have that, own this, obtain that. None of those go to heaven with you. But the people around you, they do. But they can. The people God puts you in their life and them in your life, part of those forever people that you get to share heaven with. Peter reminds us, blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of the dead, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to the inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven. There's that word inheritance. Remember, you know this. Why do you submit? Why do we place ourselves under authority? Why do we do what they say ask us to do as long as they're not asking us to sin against God? Because we are a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world in every relationship. And one of the fundamental characteristics of a genuine believer is submission to authority. There are no rebels in heaven. Can I say that again? No rebellion in heaven. And God is going to continually flesh out your rebellion and my rebellion and show it to me as a part of making me more like Christ. And he's going to do that in the context of relationships. So he says, listen, you're under authority. Live under it. But remember, you have the greatest authority as God's. Don't ever violate that for anyone. And there's an inheritance coming. It's unlike anything you've ever received. Whatever the greatest gift is that you've ever received, whatever that prized possession one time you received and you thought, man, that is so awesome. It's amazing. All of those gifts are corruptible, defilable, and can be taken away. But not heaven. Not what, the, what God has prepared for us in, in, in glory. None of that can be touched. And so we are laying up our treasures in heaven, and he ends in verse 24, and he says, you serve the Lord Christ, and that really is, it, it, it kind of doesn't, I mean, the way our translation gets it is, is, is for you serve Christ, it's kind of like, okay, you know you're going to receive a, a reward, and kind of like keep serving because you serve Christ, but it's really, it, it's a command. It is actually, so the, it is the command of serve like a slave, so the word doulos is put in a verbal form, you serve like a slave, Jesus. And it is a command. You're doing this for him, for his glory. So you come under his authority. You serve Christ and you live life as a slave of Jesus Christ. It's a command. And it's a command given in the context of bond servants because it's also meant, because you know how the text ends, masters remember to treat your bond servants with kindness and justice because you have a master in heaven. You're not an ultimate master. 
all of us are slaves. So this command set right here in the middle is actually to all of us, not just those who lived as slaves. He's saying you live under authority. You serve Christ as a slave. And that's to the whole church. The second person plural, you, church, live as the slaves of Jesus Christ. Live as the slaves of the true Lord. Because he who does wrong, and that's where he comes back, that you embrace accountability. One of the things we've learned through discipleship and the different books you read on discipleship is the idea of somebody actually asking you a question about how your life went, how, how your spiritual life's going, and how things are going in your family and stuff. We, all, we like to do church like where we all see each other, we smile. Hi, how you doing? You doing good? Yeah, doing great. How's life? Oh, it's great. We all lie to each other. We feel good about it. We walk out of church and we don't see each other until next week. Come back next week and say, well, how are you doing? Oh, we're doing good. Everything's great. Okay, in the middle of the week, life fell apart. Who were you talking to? Who was there when then you got up late and said, I have no time for the Bible today, and then the next day you just didn't care to read your Bible, you didn't feel like reading the Bible, you, you, you've got memory verses, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it someday. It's really not that important to memorize Scripture, it's not. And how many hours you spend on your device, on social media, watching television, how many hours you spend what? And it's not important to memorize Scripture? Who's the one asking you when you memorize Scripture? Oh, I know this. We're supposed to go make disciples. We all know that. Well, who are you trying to win to Christ? Oh, I don't know. Well, when's the last time somebody asked you who you're trying to win to Christ? Well, they shouldn't ask me that. They shouldn't? Do you think Jesus isn't asking you that? Do you think you're not going to be asked that when you stand before Jesus Christ? What did you do with the gifts and abilities I've given you? We tend to think that accountability is that Jesus is this negative thing. We're all under authority. We're accountable. We're going to give an account to Jesus, aren't we? And God actually has us move towards authority because here's the thing. It doesn't matter how big and in charge you think you are. You have a master in heaven. Here's the other good news. It doesn't matter how small you think you are or how little you've been treated by other people. Other people can sometimes make you feel irrelevant, treat you as small and unworthy of their time. Do you know what? You still have a master in heaven. Same one. And he loves you. And he gives you the privilege of serving him. So it doesn't really matter what people think about you, does it? If they all come to you and say, oh, yes, sir, you're a great master. We've got to be under you. Don't let that go to your head because you're not really the master. And if you feel trivialized and unappreciated and, undes- and, and people make you feel undeserving, don't worry about them. The same master in heaven is your master, and he loves you and died for you. So just know this, that in your life, at the end of life, you're going to account to Jesus Christ. There is no partiality. Those who do wrong are going to be repaid. They're going to receive a just recompense. In fact, the Bible uses that language in a number of places. This text, again, just deals with accountability. Don't present your body to sin. All right, don't let it rain. Don't present your body, but present yourself to God as one alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. We're to live this way every day. We present ourselves to God to go do his calling. So just jump back here for a second. So we embrace accountability. We embrace it in our relationships. That's one of the reasons why we, we, we like discipleship groups around here. We encourage them. We, we encourage you to get to know. Because here's the thing. Unless some, when somebody knows you, and you know they care, and they ask you the hard question, you usually don't get offended by it. Now, if you walked in church next Sunday morning, and somebody that's a member of this church you don't really know that well jumped up in your face and said, who did you share the gospel with this week? Huh? Huh? All right, here's, here's our fill-in card. Fill in the blanks. Who you shared the gospel with? How many tracts did you give out? How many times did you spend in the Word? What passage did you read? And you'd be like, dude, I'm not coming back here ever again. This is nuts. Oh, by the way, we used to do that. We used to have cards in Sunday school where you could fill them out, check them out, what you did. Because, you, you know, we've all done checkbox Christianity. You know, you got to get your box checked because if I don't, somebody's going to ask me to get my box checked. People aren't boxes. Your devotional life is not a box to be checked. It's a God to be served, to be loved. So when we open up our Bible, I'm not opening my Bible to get my box checked. I'm open by the Bible to hear from the God of heaven because I need him to speak to me. And I'm under his authority and I want to do his will and not my own. And if I don't have my heart checked by the will of God, I will do my own. And I know what comes at the end of doing my own will, a mess. 
but we live under accountability because we genuinely are. We embrace accountability because we need it. And we need people to ask us those hard questions. Because if we're never asked those hard questions, you know what your flesh is like. It makes an excuse not to obey God at every corner you turn. We'll make an excuse not to be in the Word. We'll make an excuse not to memorize it, not to witness. We'll have excuse. We got excuse. Just ask me. I can tell you mine. We are good excuse makers. And what we need is we need to stop making excuses and we need to trust and obey because we really believe we are slaves of Jesus Christ. That our lives belong to him. Who would you like your life to belong to? You realize if you don't live in obedience to Jesus Christ, you actually make your life a slave of men? I mean, let's just face it. I mean, we could take the fashion world. You know, fashions come and go. You know, if some of us have lived long enough on the earth that we can go back in our closets and find things that used to be in fashion years ago that came back into fashion. Isn't it amazing? You can go through the cycles of up and down of what people say is fashionable, what they don't say is fashionable, all the different things of the world. You can become the yo-yo of men's opinions, of their approval, of what they value, and you're constantly shifting, and you're chasing the things that the world tells you is important. Or you don't have to live that way. You simply live as a slave of Jesus Christ. You report every day to the one who is the true Lord and Master, and you get your marching orders from him and not the world around you. And then you know what? Those kind of people make great community leaders, don't they? Do you know what they are? They're kind, and they're just. They're fair, and they're just. You want to be under authority? This is the kind of authority you want to be under. The kind that's like Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus, strong and kind. And so we want to come under those who are under authority, but they, uh, that, that we may have boss, we may have whatever relationship we're under authority, what we really want, and this is one of the ways we pray, we pray that our government would be just and fair. That it has a master in heaven, that it actually would be under the uh, heaven's authority, that it would actually recognize it, live under it, rather than revolt against it and lead a nation to revolt against it. So slaves of Christ make the best leaders because they will themselves be just and fair. As we battle in the warfare against sin, as we battle to live out this reality of slaves of Jesus Christ, I'd like to end with just one encouraging note. I mentioned many times and probably more times than I should, because not should, I, it's the right warning. Your flesh will always battle against doing what's right. The Bible's really clear, in your flesh dwells no good thing. There's always a warfare. We're in the middle of, a, of the flesh versus spirit warfare all the time, and the flesh will always compromise. It will always look for second best. It will always look for an excuse, a reason not to do what God's called you to do. And we probably emphasize that to the neglect of balancing that a little bit. Because he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. Amen? And the Spirit of God is actually fighting for you every day. Isn't that encouraging? So while your flesh will betray God this fast, the Spirit of God is constantly fighting for you. That's why you get up in the morning and you get some time with the Lord. You get in the Word. That's why you take time to memorize the Scripture because the Spirit of God always uses the Word of God to fight that battle for you. And then He fights that battle for you and that causes you to take pause before you act. You think, I should go, and then you're like, ah, maybe not. And some of you have never even stopped to think, why did you pause? What made you stop and think, maybe that wasn't the best course of action? You think, well, I just had a moment's inspiration. It was intuition. No, it wasn't. Not if you're a child of God. It's the Spirit of God fighting against sin, prompting you in your conscience to stop, pause, consider, wait. Do you know anything you do against your conscience is sin? And God created that conscience, and God works through that conscience, and he speaks, and the Spirit of God speaks in you and works in you, and he is the one actually working always for you, fighting for you. And so you come to, I'm going to go do, I mean, we ought to be examining everything by the Word of God, amen? We ought to be praying, God, give us wisdom, help us do the next right thing. I want to discern, what do I need to know in confusing days and all the confusion? What do I need to know? I, I would like to know, and many of us have said this, I'd like that crystal ball that I would know how all this is going to work out. My answer to that is no, I thank God he doesn't give me that. Because there's so many things between now and then that I'm going to go through that I just would rather be surprised. I don't want to know ahead of time. 
I'll walk through those when those come because I know this, God's grace is always sufficient for whatever's ahead. But what God does help us with is to know the next right thing to do. And the question is, are you content with that? Are you in the Word enough to know it? The next right thing. And that's what we ask God to help us to do. Lord, let me do the next right thing. Because remember, slave at the beginning of the day, he doesn't generally get the whole marching orders for the day. It's here, go do this, then go do this, then go do this. I go complete the task. I come back and do the next one. What, what's next, Lord? We live as slaves of Jesus Christ. I promise he has all the wisdom in the world, all the ability in the world. His spirit dwells with you, and he will direct your steps. Amen? But we have to live as slaves of Jesus Christ, not slaves of men, not as our own. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your kindness. Thank you for your people, their patience. It's a longer text, a longer issue, a lot of different streams of thought to, to try and get our minds around. And Lord, I pray we've done decently with your word today. And that you'd help us think out and think these truths and think carefully about it and the difficulties of the day we live. Father, we need wisdom. We need grace. We need to know how to respond to the various aspects of the changing culture around us and, and the nuance of life in our workday world and how we live out the reality of our relationship with you as the slaves of Jesus Christ and not of men. So, Lord, help us to live under your authority in full submission as accountable, laying up treasures in heaven, and that we might actually engage in the work you've given us to do, that we will report to duty every day, that we would get our, as we come out, as we rise up from bed each day, that we would be reminded, think of, dwell on, that our lives don't belong to us, they belong to you, and who better to belong to? The one who knows all things, controls all things, works all things together for good for those who are among the redeemed, to those who love God and are the called. Lord, thank you for calling us from sin, for rescuing us from its burden, and enabling us to serve you, to seek first the kingdom of God, to lay up our treasures in heaven. So Lord, help us to do it better. And help us to be a lighthouse of the gospel and not to make excuses, not to bow to fear, but actually to push forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ, finding creative ways to share the gospel with others that they might be gloriously saved, that they might know the hope that comes from Christ. Thank you, Father, for the kingdom that we're going to inherit. Thank you for the confidence it gives us to live in this day. So, Lord, help us to live better as your slaves in this culture, making you known. And we'll be careful to give you the glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for your patience. Sorry, it's a little bit longer text. There's so many streams of thought that we could cover and deals just the way our culture is folding and moving. And just trying to understand some of the different influences in culture that you're facing and that we're all facing. And then how we make wise biblical decisions, respond biblically, and allow the Word of God to really direct our steps. So thank you for your patience for a little bit longer message this morning. And uh, with that, you'll be dismissed. Again, tonight, no online service. I mean, sorry, no in-person service. Online service. I'll say it correct. We will be online at 530 for a devotional and a time of prayer. Uh, so hopefully you can join us then. Our plan is next week to have services as normal. Uh, if things change, we will let you know. You are dismissed. Thank you.